LTC was a big LAN tournament that happened this past weekend in Austin, Texas. Having been there in person to participate and then looking at the conversations going on around the tournament online afterward, I was once again confronted with a disconnect I've been dealing with since back when I was running melee events out of the fourth floor laundry room of a college dorm. The experience of a tournament viewer is completely different from the experience of a player. The two experiences are symbiotic, and especially in more tight-knit grassroots communities, there will be a decent amount of overlap between who views a tournament and who actually participate. But even now, and only more so as the scene grows, what a viewer wants to see and what a player wants to experience are different. What makes a player happy and a viewer happy is different. Tournament organizers are in the difficult position of having to balance both sets of needs in a fundamentally unpredictable environment while still keeping the tournament running smoothly, fairly, and on time. Let's talk about the NFL for a second, just for a comparison. 113 million people watched the Super Bowl this year. It's only a tiny, tiny percentage of those people who actually play American football. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if a majority of the people watching had never been on a football team before. It's a dangerous sport, frankly. This is a sport in which players who are just short of the size of sumo wrestlers are sprinting at speeds you wouldn't think they're capable of trying to tackle the smaller, more agile ball carrier on every single play. Getting tackled by a smaller player just means that they're hitting you at an even faster speed, sometimes from angles you're not ready to get hit from. It's well documented that concussions are very common and damaging to the lives of former players. Most human beings do not, and should not, play professional American football. It takes extreme athleticism and durability to get tackled by a pro linebacker, get up and play the game again. But people show up to watch this in droves. It's fascinating to see what peak athletes are physically capable of and how they can train to throw athletes like them down onto the ground at high speeds. In fact, football players doing what the audience can't is part of the point of watching. I'm so much more impressed at a long pass getting caught when I think about how far I'm capable of throwing a football accurately and how much further it got thrown to land in the end zone. Even if someone did play the sport at some point, almost everyone is watching it be played at a much higher level. It's letting middle-aged men reminisce about their high school glory days, letting little boys aspire to be able to stiff arm an adult man off his feet one day, Letting people who played in the backyard see what it's like to satisfy their curiosity in much the way that people look up a speedrun for a game they just finished casually. The audience is understood to be a set of people who are less intimately familiar with what's happening on the field. And if you stop to think about it, you should come to the conclusion that that's a good thing for the sport. You shouldn't have to know the entire offensive line of the Detroit Lions by name to enjoy watching a Lions game. You get more viewership, more visibility, more money by making the game accessible even to people who don't know what they're talking about. Esports are compared in name to sports for good reason, as it's by far the closest comparison we can make to any other pursuit. But there are also some important differences to address real quick. Esports are fundamentally more accessible. You can play top-level Splatoon from a wheelchair. You can't say the same thing about the NFL. Also, since esports don't need to invest in big stadiums, courts, or fields, or whatever, there's typically a lower barrier to entry. Think about golf courses. Think about the amount of land, water, grass seed maintenance it takes just to be able to play the game of golf at all. No, seriously, think about it. Golf is honestly kind of problematic. Now think about what you need to play Splatoon. Just a TV, which a lot of people have anyway, an internet connection, which a lot of people have anyway, a game console and a controller, and a LAN adapter with a hard ethernet connection to your router, if that's at all possible, because the game's net code is bad enough without you being a source of connection problems, but if you can't do that, we understand and it's okay. You don't even have to leave your home to play this game. Until LTC recently, I hadn't left my home to play this game competitively in tournaments since before Splatoon 3 came out. Because the line between player and audience member blurs like this, I think people sometimes get mixed up about which side of that spectrum they're on when they watch a tournament. 
Now, don't get me wrong, there is no shortage of reasons to make fun of Twitch chatters and YouTube commenters, but I think this particular reason is one of the main things Popgun is criticizing when he good-naturedly mocks, quote, the idiots in Twitch chat, unquote. He's making fun of the armchair quarterbacks, the critics who don't know the challenges of creating, the people who think they know as much as the people they're watching just from the perspective they've cultivated without having actually been there and done that. There was a picture of Chara and I from LTC, and someone commented on it that it's cool to see me and him hanging out outside of Splatoon and content creation. Uh, we definitely don't hang out in Splatoon. Uh, to my recollection, I've played exactly one game of Splatoon with or against Chara ever, specifically in Splatoon 2. And it was a ranked match, so we were just put together randomly. People make all these weird, faulty inferences and conflations about public visible people and the things they do, and that's just a part of being more well-known and visible than before. As a tournament organizer, a community figurehead, a content creator, a tournament player, Popgun and I have both seen our fair share of people who just don't understand why things are the way they are, and so they come to strange, dysfunctional conclusions about how a tournament should be run or a production should be handled because of it. In our own ways, even we are outsiders in the sense that we're not playing at the top level of competitive Splatoon. So, when it comes to in-game decisions, we're reacting to something that feels like it's just being come up with in the moment, when if we'd been grinding plus one server scrims for the last month, we may have seen that weapon comp or tactic coming from a mile away. This brings me to the topic of commentary, which I think is pretty misunderstood by a lot of the community. There's a long-time joke about the commentator's curse, where the commentator seems to immediately jinx the players with what they say. I've often quipped that the real commentator's curse is that the players who are most knowledgeable about the gameplay and storylines at any tournament are always going to be the players who make it to the latest rounds of the tournament and are never actually available to hop on the mic. Now, there are certainly ways around this problem. Most NFL casters are just retired players. You can also bring on analysts or coaches, the kinds of players who will keep up with the top-level metagame to a significant degree but won't actually be playing. But even so, there's always going to be the issue that learning the game at a top level means you're not able to do as many other things with your time. So finding someone who can both commentate well and play with a top-level understanding of the game is rare. This is a much smaller problem than most people seem to think it is. There are commentators who don't play Splatoon at all, who I'd rather listen to than some competitive players that we put on the mic. See, we have to remember the difference between viewer and player. You can watch football all your life and enjoy doing so and still never learn the difference between nickel and 3-4 defenses. An NFL player absolutely fundamentally needs to know that, but you aren't going to hear commentators explaining it very often, because it's boring. It's nerd stuff. It's, if you're really interested in analyzing how this game works, you've either had this explained by your coach at a young age, or you've done your own research and watched someone pausing and unpausing one play for 15 minutes explaining all the moving parts stuff. Commentators fundamentally cannot analyze a game of Splatoon very efficiently in real time. Typically when I do a VOD review, when I break down a tournament match or coach someone based on a ranked match they played, that process is taking something like 45 minutes for just one Splatoon game. Heck, part of the advantage of real analysis is that we get to take our time and think for longer about something that happened really fast in the moment that we needed to react to quickly. That's the environment where learning happens. But nobody wants to watch that on a tournament broadcast, not even the nerds. This is an issue that I had with a previous video that I put out, where I labeled it as a reaction to the Sizzle Season trailer, when really it was analysis, and I think a lot of people showed up looking for the React content and instead got analysis and were bugged by me pausing it over and over again. We want to get swept up in the hype of the in-person crowd roaring and cheering when the underdog pulls out a win with an unorthodox, unexpected strategy. We don't want a complex interlocking system of fundamentals derived from game mechanics optimized through a combination of analysis and a borderline unhealthy amount of practice. When we're looking for a good time, we don't want what really happens at a tournament on stage. We want a shonen anime. There's an entire other video on this topic to be made about the subject of trash talk, how having a heel, a villain in the community is compelling from a viewer's perspective while being entirely toxic for players. 
I think to do that video justice, I'm going to need to make it its own separate part two to this video instead of tacking it on to the end of this one. So I'll just tell you to look out for that part two, and when it does come out, I'll try to remember to link it here so you can go from one to the next. Occasionally, real life does actually follow that perfect shonen anime storyline that we want out of it, and those moments are really special, but most of the time it doesn't. LTC definitely wasn't a storybook ending. Going into Grand Finals, I would confidently have bet you $100 that Starburst doesn't drop a single game, and I would have taken your money if you'd taken that bet. For the players, that's absolutely the way it should be. It was fair. Starburst won, and since everything was fair, they proved that they were the best team on that day. But for viewers, this very fair, well-broadcasted tournament wasn't the best experience. Fan favorite Last Resort, which Prochara, extremely popular content creator, plays for, lost to a team I have to think they were seeded to beat, and as soon as they lost, viewership on stream dropped substantially. Sometimes, coming to a real honest understanding of why the game worked the way it did, why one team won and the other lost, isn't the most entertaining thing you can do on the mic. Sometimes analysis isn't what the viewers really want to see. And when that's the case, I believe it is absolutely the correct decision for a commentator to try and make the match entertaining in some other way. I say that as an educator, as a commentator who leans very analytical, as someone who sees a lot of value and appeal in the nerd stuff. Sometimes it's better for the viewers, better for our image as a scene, better for the viewership numbers that make the production team and the tournament organizers happy, the numbers that open the scene up to sponsorships and bigger, better venues and production quality later on down the line, to be an improv comedian, a storyteller, an MC, than to be an analyst. You want to learn something from LTC's Grand Finals? I don't care if you used some sort of space-time paradox to have the entire roster of Starburst reacting to and commentating their own set live after they've already played it. You'll still learn more from muting the commentary, pausing the video frequently, and thinking for yourself about exactly what happened, play-by-play, -play, in a single game of that set, over a period of an hour, taking your time, than you will from watching that game's five-minute broadcast. Commentary can add insights you might not have thought about, which is what I'm always seeking to do when I can on the mic, but going through that exercise is so much more educational that if you take the time to do it, a tournament broadcast cannot possibly compete with it. So if you're the type that gets upset about casters cracking jokes, about the play-by-play -play caster not necessarily pointing out every single time someone gets splatted as if they're not doing their jobs, you simply do not have a realistic expectation of what that caster can or should be doing. There is a healthy balance. It's obviously inappropriate for a caster to not talk about the match at all and turn the set into their own personal stand-up comedy routine to steal the show from the players. But the healthy balance is way further in the entertainment direction than a lot of the, quote, idiots in Twitch chat, unquote, seem to believe. For those who might still be a little bit skeptical about that idea, I want to bring up the example of the Wombo Combo. This is from a time where Super Smash Bros. Melee was in very dark straits as a competitive community. It had just been let go from MLG, so it didn't have that major circuit that was getting a lot of eyeballs on it. The sequel to this game was already released, but some people were still playing Melee because they preferred that to Brawl. Now remember that this is from 2008, so this is a time period where Twitch does not exist. This is a time where esports broadcasts are nowhere near the level, the size, the scale, the amount of money, production quality that they are today. But to this day, the Wombo Combo still lives on in people's minds as a phenomenal example of commentary. To be clear, you will learn absolutely nothing about the game from watching the Wombo Combo commentary. The point is that you feel like you're in the room listening to everyone lose their minds around you while you listen to it. That experience of feeling like you were there is something that people will watch a video for. 
and it's made this clip so memorable that it even became a piece of League of Legends terminology, the Wombo Combo, a combination of abilities that locks an opponent in place. That video is something that allowed Melee to live for a much longer amount of time, because it popularized the game in a way that few other clips ever have. And it's in part because of this kind of media that the game has been able to continue for so long. If someone were to tell me that these guys on the mic yelling profanities and just losing their minds are not doing their jobs, that this isn't good for the community or something, I would ask them to reconsider given the impact that it ended up having. Not everything has to be buttoned up to be good for the scene. Not everything has to be super professional. We can have more adult-oriented content, we can have more loose, unprofessional content, and still have a cohesive, valuable community for other people to monetize and for other people to help us grow. Once part two is out, there will be a link to it at the top right, as well as in this video's description. Until then, I'm just going to get significantly more people to like the video and subscribe to the channel by telling them to do so right now, because people are easily suggestible, and it's considered good marketing to take advantage of that for your own personal profit, instead of helping people try to come to a better personal understanding of themselves so they can resist it and act more in their own self-interest. Remember to like and subscribe! Bye!